Hello and welcome back to the She Who Dares Wins podcast and I am so excited to kick off season four with my friend and guest Kelsey Exon. I said you I was like Erickson. <laughs> <laughs> no you nailed it. It's a good start. It's a good yeah. start. Kelsey okay so what does She Who Dares Wins and Forge Your Own Path kind of mean to you and how have you done that so far in your life? Great question. Uh, to me well, I think I can answer it kind of one and the same. For me, forging my own path has been seeing seeing opportunities and just going for them and not letting not letting expectations of others dictate what I do or don't pursue, not letting the kind of beaten path be the only option. Um, for me and something that's different to, I think, a lot of people, especially uh, those that have come through academia or through like a pretty traditional background is, um, I never had a plan. Like I never, I never thought about doing a master's. Um, I didn't, I don't even think I knew what a PhD was when I started my master's, ended up doing a master's onto a PhD into a post doc essentially. And now, um, working for a national governing body in sport. Um, and I get asked a lot, you know, kind of how, how did you know, or what was your plan? Like, when did you decide you were going to do all these things? And I didn't, like, I, I never really had a plan. I just pursued the things that were of interest to me and also gave myself freedom to change my mind about what was of interest to me. And for me, that has worked out really well because I've had the freedom to say yes to opportunities when they presented themselves because I wasn't so like committed to pursuing a specific pathway that I was blinded to opportunities that were right there in front of me. Uh, and so I think sometimes look at people do look at me as, as if I forged this new path, but really, I think I've just said yes to certain opportunities, uh, when they've been there. And I, and I would say like, I see it as I was in the right place at the right time in a lot of situations, but as I've kind of talked to other colleagues, um, at various points in my life, they've been like, no, like you made those opportunities or you, you created those opportunities. And, and it's probably a little bit of both, but I, I think the big thing is I was willing to, to say yes, take chances and walk into the unknown at various points because I was pursuing things that were of interest to me in that moment while trusting that I would have the opportunity to go a different direction at some point if that was no longer of interest to me or or maybe just that something else was of more interest to me. Amazing. Now, where does this come from? That's a great question. Um, well, I can say, and maybe this will be of interest to some people. So I am the person who I spent the night away from home from my parents' house for the first time ever when I was 14 years old. And it was at my aunt's house in the same town, very close by. Um, but I was the kid that was scared to do anything growing up. Like my, we never had babysitters because I would never sleep. And so my parents were like, okay, this is not worth it. Um, you know, they'd leave me with a babysitter and I would be sitting there wide awake when they came home, no matter what the time was. Cause I just, I had so much anxiety. Uh, I never slept. And so my plan was that I was going, there's a great university. I'm from Bellingham, Washington. There's a great university there. It's like maybe a 10 minute walk from my house or my parents' house. And so I had told my parents in middle school, like, Hey, just so you know, basically like I'm going to be going to Western. I'm going to live with you guys at your home. Like I'm going to be in your life day in and day out for the rest of my life. Like th that's my option. Um, but then when I got to high school, I wanted to play, I knew I wanted to play basketball. And in order to play basketball, I was going to have to spend the night at a basketball camp in the summer. Um, and so I was 14 going into my freshman year and I was like, all right, I have to figure out how to spend the night. And so my aunt who lived in the same town, I made an agreement with her that I would go to her house. I would spend the night, but she had to sit in a chair at the end of my bed and stay awake until I fell asleep. And so this was the big plan. Like, mind you, I'm 14, not four. And so I went there and bless her. I literally like every minute was like, are you still awake? Are you still awake? And she's like, yes, Kelsey. I'm so are you still awake? Yes, Kelsey. I'm so are you still awake? finally fell asleep. And so at 14, I spent the night away from home for the first time. So I was the last person that would ever be thought, like, n I never would have imagined in my wildest dreams that I would not only like, I wouldn't have even got on a plane to go abroad, let alone move abroad. Um, so I think like growing up with such a fear of anything, um, which was totally my own doing, uh, 
I spent the night for the first time at 14, went to high school, had a great time, then moved out of state, went to California for college. And then a week after I graduated college, I played basketball in college. So some of it definitely came from being an athlete, um, played basketball. And then a week later, a week after I graduated, I moved to London. Um, my cousins had moved there from Seattle and they're like, why don't you come out and nanny for us and just like explore some more. I'd never been abroad. I'd been to Mexico once with them the year before, but like that was the only time I had a passport. Um, and so I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go. Um, and then I moved to London and it was meant to be three weeks and I ended up staying for two years. And then I decided to do my master's and I got back into volleyball, played volleyball during my master's and just, I think I had just developed a a curiosity for people for sure. And empathy for people. Um, I have obsessive compulsive disorder. I'd been diagnosed when I was really young and I'd always hidden it. Um, had gone to counseling as a teenager, like in my 12, 13, 14, got diagnosed, went to counseling, but I would always tell people like I was going to the doctor or I was going to the dentist, which in hindsight, I don't know how they didn't add up that I went to the doctor every week, um, and was never sick. Um, but I had like, I had a, a, a strong level of empathy from a young age because I knew what it was like to hide something from everybody. Um, and so I think when I got to like post-college uh, and going into my master's and moving to England, um, I was the outsider. I was in a new space. I was uncomfortable. I didn't really know what I was doing. And I just kind of dove in. Uh, and as I started to, to do research and to do my master's, um, it was something that I'd never like really thought about before. And I think that interested me as like, I've never considered this path. I've never consi considered doing research. And now here I am doing this thing and enjoying it. Like I'm living in a foreign country and enjoying it. I'm playing volleyball after playing basketball in my masters. I never thought I would have the chance to play volleyball again. Uh, and so it was just kind of like, wow, these are, you know, like I never thought about any of those things, these things. And suddenly here I am doing all of them and loving it. And like, wow, what, what else might, I enjoy doing or like what other opportunities might I have never considered that I should maybe be like at least open-minded to. Um, and so I think that's just been a lot of it is like just kind of saying yes to opportunities when, when they were presented with, without necessarily really knowing where they would lead and becoming more and more comfortable with that of like, you know what? Yeah. That, that invitation or offer sounds interesting right now. Like I don't really know where it's going to take me. And actually, I don't even really know where I want it to take me. Um, but I've always been the kind of person that like, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it all the way and I'm going to give it my best effort. And and I think that that's just kind of as I've gone from being like a student and, and an athlete um, into more of just like the professional realm, I've just continued that attitude and that approach of like, I've committed to this. So therefore, I'm going to give it everything I have until for whatever reason, it's no longer the best thing for me to be doing. Um, and I think that that's, yeah, just kind of carried on and continued to be my, my mentality. And, and when I, whenever that I, I start to waver from that, like my approach is all my, my kind of mantra or motto has always been right here, right now. Like I want to be in this moment. I want to give it everything I have. Um, and if this, this moment, this right here changes in two years or so be it, then that's, I'll make it all about that. Um, but right now this, whatever this is, is what I'm committed to. And so therefore I'm going to go all in and and see where that takes me. See, I can massively relate to that. And actually, I, I consider myself as always been a bit of an underdog. And I was the quiet kid. And it was only after years of like stepping out that I realized, oh, there's so much more that you can do once you just make that initial step forward. Um, you come across as someone that is incredibly confident. Um, and I had no idea about that, you know, when you were 14, which is incredible. Do you think just recently I heard that high achieving girls and very confident young girls actually struggle later on in life because they feel like they have always achieved. Therefore, if they try new things and fail, then it's going to massively implicate them. I've always felt like being the underdog has given me um, a bit more of a spur to just be like, well, if it, it doesn't matter because have you? Felt, it sounds like you kind of felt like that and then it's just propelled you each step that you've gone. Um, would you kind of agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I also don't like, I've never been afraid to fail. Um, and I think, and I don't really know where that comes from, but I mean, I would maybe the, maybe not so in sport, like in sport, definitely I always wanted to win and there was a clear definition of failure, but outside of sport, like I, 
what does failure look like? I guess like getting fired maybe, but, um, for me, I, I think it's just been more like, I want to make the most of the opportunity that's in front of me. And I can define what success looks like in that. Um, in my current role, for example, like I'll consider success some days it's like, Oh, I crossed one thing off my to-do list, like winning. And then other days it's, you know, I was able to get this person connected with a counselor and suddenly like they're on a better path or other days it's, we got a gold medal. Like, I, I think that it, there's a danger in black and white definitions of success. And so I think that's been something that has helped me as well is like, I, I think I've been a little bit more experientially focused and definitely relationally focused. And so, yeah, maybe a job doesn't end up being exactly what I wanted or a project doesn't go exactly how I wanted, but who did I meet in that process? And like, what relationships did I build in that process? And what experiences did I have that might spur me on in the future? And I think that that's like, especially as women, we are our own worst critics. Um, and so I think that that's something that for, for whatever reason, I've been able to be pretty kind to myself with is just kind of like, you know what, like, you're not going to be the best at everything and you're not going to be great at everything, but you can, and, and this maybe goes back as I'm thinking about it to being an athlete too, is like, I was never the best. I was always one of the best athletes, but I was never the best, but I always worked harder than everybody else. And I knew I could always do that. Um, and so I think that that is something that has transferred into my daily life as well Is like, I'm not always going to be the most successful in everything that I do, but I can always work as hard as every other person next to me. And the reality is hard work pays off. Like it doesn't always get you to the top in everything, but it always works to your favor. Um, and so I think that that's part of it too, is like being mindful of your definition of success and how realistic is that. Um, and then also just really focusing on the things that you can control because sometimes the way that you're defining success is it, ultimately the measures are out of your control. Like I can't control every time I get a promotion or a selection for a certain thing or, a, you know, accolades for something like sometimes that's out of my control, but I can control my work ethic. I can control if I operate from a place of integrity. Um, I can control my attitude. I can control if I'm getting the right amount of sleep, like those are things that are in my control. And so, you know, again, that kind of goes back to, to being an athlete and con controlling the controllables. And, um, so yeah, I mean, yes and no, yeah. I think there's that underdog mentality in some of it. And then, you know, I think some things have generally come naturally to me and I haven't necessarily had to work that hard at them. Um, but I think regardless of, of my status or like my level of aptitude in something, for me, I've always just been like, if I commit to something, I'm going to go all in. Uh, and I might be more successful in some spaces than others, but I'm going to always go all in. And to be honest, which you watching your career progression has been incredible. Um, for the listeners out there, just explain to me now your current role, what you do and, um, and what you're working on right now. Yeah. So, uh, my title is senior director of athlete health engagement and experience at USA cycling. Um, I joined the organization four years ago, 2019, uh, had no background in cycling, which was very intentional. Um, I was, I had just kind of briefly what got me to that point. I did my master's in sports psychology at Leeds Beckett. And then I honestly kind of for no real reason did a PhD. Um, that wasn't really a plan, but it was kind of a way to stay around. And my master's had gotten a little bit of attention and I was like, well, okay, like why not do a PhD? So glad I did. Um, but what I focused on was the psychology of doping and then the psychology of whistleblowing. And what drew me to those things was doping in sport, seemingly a very black and white issue. Um, but I did qualitative research. And so I asked stories, like I asked for the stories behind people's experiences and, I've all, like, as I mentioned, I've always been very relational and I had a lot of empathy because I know what it's like to live with a secret. I know what it's like to live with something that, um, you know, you're embarrassed about in my situation, having OCD and at a young age, just not really being able to, to talk about that. Um, and so I've always like loved providing a space for people to just talk about the story behind headlines, basically, you know, for me, like it would have been, okay, you have OCD. Well, tell me what, it, like, what does it actually feel like? What is that like? And I never had done that growing up because it was just, I was too embarrassed. And so with, with doping, it was really interesting to be able, I talked to athletes who had used performance enhancing drugs or who had been impacted by others use and was able to actually get like the story and the emotions and the feelings behind what you generally just see in an article of like, so-and-so is banned for four years. Nobody really ever asked about like, well, what happened in that person's life 
that led to that headline. And so that really intrigued me. Um, and then I go from doping, which is like, again, seemingly very black and white and quickly realize there's a lot of gray to now whistleblowing or reporting doping, um, which again was like even more so a black and white issue in my mind initially. Like if you see somebody doing something wrong and it's, especially if it's impacting you, um, you report it, like that's just logical. But then right away I start asking, I start interviewing people that have actually blown the whistle on doping and quickly realize like, once again, not necessarily as black and white. There's a lot of things to consider. Um, if, if you become aware of doping or suspect doping and are considering reporting it, it's not just necessarily as simple as, you know, see something, say something. And so that was again, an interesting opportunity, um, for me to be able to just shed light on the complexity of an issue that society sees as pretty black and white, and then try to kind of provide some evidence-based information as to how we could um, improve the experience of being a whistleblower and, and encourage people to speak up more, whatever the context. So as I was kind of doing that um, and looking in those two spaces, there was a lot of stuff going on in sport around sexual misconduct in particular. And naturally there was a lot around whistleblowing on that. And so I just kind of started thinking more about like, you know, is it, is it time to maybe look a little bit beyond doping and apply my skill set in something more broad? And so the opportunity, um, a, opened up at USA Cycling to work as their safe sport director. Um, for those that don't know, safe sport in the U.S., um, the kind of remit of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport is, or the safe sport movement is we have the safe sport code, which is essentially equivalent to the WADA code, um, the prohibited list, which outlines every substance and method that's banned within sport in, in the anti-doping context. The safe sport code outlines all the behaviors that are banned within the Olympic movement in the U.S. Um, and so those include sexual misconduct, well, kind of as broad labels, sexual misconduct, physical misconduct, emotional misconduct, bullying, hazing, and harassment. And so I saw that job as an opportunity to expand my skill set beyond the doping context specifically. So I, I moved to USA Cycling, moved back to the U.S., uh, to Colorado Springs, and into a new sport. And I wanted to be in a new sport because I knew that this, I mean, these are obviously sensitive subjects. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to go into something that I had no kind of personal biases or personal experience or personal connection to so that I would go in with open eyes and open mind and, and have to be curious. Um, and I think that that's such a such an undervalued um, mentality, or I don't, I don't know if mentality is the right word, but just like curiosity is so valuable and can get you so far. And so for me going into a sport that I didn't know, like I automatically had to be curious and that was a huge asset to me. Um, so I started at USA Cycling as the director of Safe Sport, overseeing our Safe Sport program for the whole organization. Uh, and then alongside that, like I've all obviously from my own personal experiences uh, and then just being involved in sport, like mental health has always been a, a big interest of mine and something that I think, you know, we don't talk about enough or, and, and what I've seen recently is obviously there, we're talking about it more and I think that's awesome. Um, but I, I saw an opportunity to be able to kind of start being more proactive in, in the space at USA cycling around mental health. And so started working more in our sports performance team and providing support for our elite athletes uh, in, in mental health, but then also kind of in broader, I would just say like holistic athlete development. So providing opportunities for like tuition opportunities, grant opportunities, uh, job opportunities, mentorship, those types of things, just trying to develop our athletes uh, to be successful on and off the bike now and in the future when inevitably they retire, you know, 30 to 40 years before any other career person is retiring because as an athlete, you, you know, you're not going to retire at 65. Um, and so that's basically what I'm doing now, um, is serving as kind of a main point of contact and reference for our, the elite athletes, at USA cycling, um, just to be able to provide them with the support that they need and from day to day, um, to help, to help them be able to focus on what they're there to focus on, which is to be the best, best athlete they can be. Uh, and the more kind of distractions, barriers, or obstacles that I can, either equip them to go over or I can eliminate altogether for them, the better. Cool. And you mentioned that um, you're the only female in the team of what, 15? Yeah, give or take. Is that something that I would think doesn't bother you um, or didn't bother you, but is it something that does bother you or, you know, how have you felt moving into that role? Were you, were you worried? Um, and how have you felt it? Like obviously being in there now, was it five years? Yeah. Going on five years. Yeah. Honestly, like I've, I've generally been in male dominated environments, um, professionally. 
And I've always seen it as a huge asset. Like, and I know that that's kind of a controversial thing to say. Um, but for me, like as, as one of few women in any space, whether it was working in the anti-doping space at the international level or, you know, in the whistleblowing space and now in cycling, um, on a really basic level, like it, it gives me a perspective nobody else has. It gives me, a value, you know, certain experiences that no one else has had. Uh, and so it makes me relevant right away when I walk into a room. Um, and obviously, you know, that it also comes with some challenges, but I think as a woman in a male dominated environment, number one, I do, I do feel it, an obligation and responsibility that I need to lean into a little bit more, but to help create avenues for other women, um, to do that. But I, as I'm more and more in this space, I realize that I think those are oftentimes a lot more just like personal as opposed to like actual like job posting. You know, it's kind of giving permission to women to be like, no, it's okay to be one of few women in a space. And and I've personally never, I've never looked at a job and thought about it as like, could I get this job as a woman? Like if I want the job, I'm going to go for it. Um, and, you know, I think a lot about um, something I, I remember during my PhD hearing, and I don't know what the research was, but like just, you know, you you hear all, maybe you don't hear all the time, but I hear all the time. And I think about it all the time of like when, when man, men and women look at job postings, like men will look at it and be like, oh, I meet, you know, two out of 15 desired qualities. Like, perfect. I'm perfect. <laughs> you know, like I'm in. Whereas like as a woman, if we don't meet all 15, we're like, oh, no, like I'm not. Okay. Yeah. Can't apply. And yeah. like, that's on me. Like if I stop myself from applying, that's on me. Yeah. I can't be mad at anybody else. And I certainly can't be mad at the guy that applied with two out of 15 when I didn't apply with 14. Like that's, he didn't apply, like he didn't take my application spot. I just didn't put my name forward. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, that's an interesting thing to think about is just like, if I don't put my name in the hat, I'm definitely not going to get it. And yeah. so why not put it in the hat. And like, if I don't get it, I don't get it, but I wasn't going to get it anyways without trying. Um, so for me in, in my previous, like anti-doping in academia and now where I am now, like definitely I'm one of few women, but I actually quite enjoy that. Um, I would like to see more women getting involved mainly from the coaching side of things. Cause I mean, we have a lot of female athletes and when we don't have female coaches, like, I think that's a challenge. Um, but again, if some of that comes down to like, we, don't have women going for those coaching roles. And so some of it, I think is just taking a step back and thinking about, you know, like, well, what's preventing them from putting their themselves in those positions. And there's some really practical things, I think, you know, like, especially if we think about cycling and coaching, uh, our coaches are on the road all the time. And so for a lot of our female cyclists, once they retire, like part of their motivation to retire has been like, they're tired of being on the road you know, they want to be home more, or maybe they're thinking about having children and like, they want to, they want to be home and with their children. And so those jobs just practically aren't going to be the right jobs for them. Um, and so I do think we need to think about those kind of things and like, okay, well, what are maybe some of those practical barriers that are preventing us from getting women in this space? And what are the things that we could do to potentially, uh, change that? But I think from the perspective of just me personally, um, I try to, I try to lean into the the things that make being a woman in the space that I'm in of added value. Um, and then not be afraid to just speak up and, you know, point things out from a different perspective. And sometimes those are super practical things. Sometimes they're maybe a little bit more complex. Um, but I don't, I certainly don't think that the flip is, would be any better. Like if it was 14 women and one man, one, one man, one man, like, I don't think that that's a better environment either. Um, you know, I think we comp men and women in the works in the workplace and certainly in the sports space, we complement one, one another, um, and we're better together, uh, in serving our membership and serving our athletes. Um, so yeah, I think, I think a lot of it for us as women is just like not, not getting in our own way. And, and that comes down often to just having people, other women around you that you can look to yeah. and talk to yeah. and vent to, um, and they don't even have to, like, they don't have, for me, they don't have to be at my organization. They might be at a different one or they might be in a whole different field, but it's just having those women that you can go to and be like, man, this sucks. Or like, I cried in my office today. Yeah. Um, and it's like, oh yeah, me too. And you're like, okay, cool. Like let's, you know, have coffee. Cool. All right. Back to work. You know? <laughs>
<laughs> You've basically been able to describe or articulate what I've struggled with for the last 17 years <laughs> so perfectly. Um, because, yeah, um, from a factual point of view, I've gone to events where people have said, there's not enough women in construction. And the same thing. Okay, but some some women don't want to do hard labor. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a certain area of the industry where women, their lives don't want to fit into that. And I think that's an important conversation to have. So I'm gl so glad you've brought that up. Um, and you have a real clear, open way of thinking, which I think has enabled you to, well, to nail pretty much anything you've ever done. Um, so yeah, I've, I was literally thinking, I was like, 17 years, and she's just nailed it in two minutes. Like, whenever someone asks me a question, I'm like, right, just remember what Kelsey said, because she's totally got it down. Um, yeah, so for you next, um, are you still on this, I love this, like this curious path? Yeah, definitely. Like my decision making around career stuff, my, the question I ask myself is where can I have the most positive impact on the most people in the shortest amount of time? Um, and if that answer is where I am right now, then I'm going to stay where I am right now. If and when that answer changes and it's like, I don't know, or maybe then I start to think about like the next the next opportunity or the next space to go. Um, but wherever I go and wherever I am, like the curiosity piece is huge. And if nothing else, it just helps me stay interested. Like if you lose mm -hmm. your sense of curiosity, like then you're just going through the motions and that's never going to be me. Um, I'm never going to be satisfied in a job where I know exactly what's going to happen every day. And I just show up and get it done and leave. Like I want to be learning all the time. I want to be gaining knowledge and experience all the time. Uh, and so curiosity is essential to that. Okay. Now I'm going to put you outside of your comfort zone a little bit. Probably, oh probably not. Cause I know you, <laughs> you'll handle this. Um, so, all right, close your eyes. Oh boy. Okay. And I want you to go back to 16, no, no, 14 year old Kelsey. Mm -hmm. So never stayed away from home. You know, you have the secret that people don't know about. And then now, Kelsey now and all you've experienced, all you've achieved, like, what do you say to her? You can open your eyes up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm just going to take a nap. <laughs> um, that's a great question. I think what I say to her is just lean in like, and show up. And I have that on my wall at home in Colorado, a, a sign that just says show up. Um, you know, I think in, in the depths of like being diagnosed with a mental health condition at 13, 14 years old, like just life in general at 13, 14 years old, like everything is the biggest deal. Yeah. Um, and you just, you know, you think every decision is defining your life. Um, but I showed up and like, and, and I, I trusted people and that was huge. Like I was young enough that I didn't have any reason to not be open with my parents about like what I was dealing with. And I think looking back now, like that was such a blessing. Um, cause I think had I been 15, 16, you know, that age where it's like, man, my parents don't know anything. I don't want to talk to them. It would have been a really different experience. Um, and so that's, that's big. Um, but I, yeah, I would say just to myself then like trust other people, lean into other people, let them be your strength when you don't feel strong, uh, and know that this is going to I don't necessarily love the saying, like, know that this is going to make you stronger, but I would say, know that you're going to use this. Like, this is going to be an asset. And I would say, like, looking back now, going through, um, you know, dealing with with OCD and, and all of that, which is like, obviously something that I'll have for the rest of my life, but thankfully has been very manageable since that age is it's made me who I am today. Like, I know, I know what it's like to hurt. I know what it's like to to be tough and like want to want to tough something out, but like you literally cannot, like I can't outwork a mental health diagnosis. I can't out tough one, you know, same as like with the, you know, I've had two ACL surgeries. Like I can't will my ACL to heal. I needed help there. Um, and so I think that that's an important lesson to learn too, is like there's, there's people out there that can help you and that are experts in certain areas. And I'm never going to be an expert in every area. And so why not lean into those people that can support you? And that, I mean, I deal with that daily now. Like part of my job now is basically to deal with fire drills on any given day. And often the, the challenge that's put in front of me, I'm like, I have no idea. Like, I don't know how to deal. I have no experience with this. But thankfully, I have a network of people that I can lean into. And chances are one of them has or more has experience in this. And so, you know, I think that was something that inadvertently I learned at a really young age is like, 
there are people with expertise in a lot of different areas and it's to your benefit to lean into them and let them do what they're trained to do um, to make your life easier and more manageable. Uh, and then, you know, that just continues to be something that I live by today is like, I don't, thankfully, I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have to be an expert in everything at any given moment. But the more people I get to know, the more I network, the more I build a community around me, the more people I have to lean into uh, at any given moment, for whatever reason, who can help me either in guiding myself in my own life or in guiding, you know, somebody, one of my athletes or they're not my athletes, but like one of our athletes or my colleagues or whatever. Um, and so I think that's huge too. And that like, that's looking back now and kind of just connecting the dots as we're speaking. Like, I think that was something I learned at that young age that has continued to benefit me, especially as a woman in a male dominated environment, because I think oftentimes we either directly or indirectly get the message of like, don't show weakness or don't show that mm -hmm. you don't have the answers. Like you need to have it all figured out. And that's total crap. Like yeah. nobody has all the answers and you're only hurting yourself and holding yourself back if you're not willing to ask for help or admit you don't know something. Um, and I think actually men are much, maybe tend to be better at that because they don't you know, like we, like the research shows, you know, if they have two out of 15 criteria, they're like, yep, I'm the perfect man for the job. Um, and so, you know, when they're like, well, what about these other 13? It's like, oh yeah, I'll figure that out. Um, whereas women, we tend to be more like, well, shoot, like, I don't know. So obviously I, I can't be good at this. And it's like, no, like nobody has all those 15 things. You figure it out as you go and you find the people that help you fill the gaps. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And well, it is she who dares wins, but I also like looking at I guess failure, because I, I always feel like failure has a negative connotation, but actually I've learned a lot from failures over the years. So can you tell me, and this can be anything, um, a time at which you have, in your mind, failed, and then what you've learned from that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if this will be a good example of failure, but it's like one of the most defining moments, I would say, in my career. And it's, it's maybe not a failure, but it's some, it's definitely an example of me going in unprepared and then, um, basically trying to recover from it. But so when I was doing my masters, um, I decided to do interviews and do qualitative research, which I didn't really know what that was at the time, but I had prepared this interview guide. And one of the questions that I asked, um, the participants was, why did you first get involved in sport? Super basic, super simple. Like it was like an opening, like opener question to like get the conversation flowing. And so my very first interview, it was a practice interview with, uh, just one of my, um, fellow students. Cause we were going to like help each other get ready. And I was recording it and it was just like, let's figure out if like my, the flow of questions works and zero pressure, like just figure this out. So, but we did it for real, you know, it was like, give me a real answer. And so the very first question I asked him was like, Hey, I don't think I said, Hey, um, but it was, you know, tell me why you first got involved in sport. And he was a boxer or had been a boxer I and mean, he still was at the time. So like a pretty tough macho guy. And I asked him this question and he starts to talk and just bursts into tears. Wow. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And turns out he had gotten into sport because he was severely bullied by his brother and he, he needed to protect himself. Um, and I guess no one had really asked him that question before and like he hadn't really thought about it. And so I asked him this question and he just, I mean, bursts out in tears yeah. and I, like, I was so caught off guard and I, I remember like in the moment I was just kind of like, uh, do you, like, do you want me to stop recording? Like, do you want Kleenex? And he's like, yes, please. And, uh, it's so, like, I turned off the recording and I was just like, I was so uncomfortable and so like, just like, oh my gosh, what could I have done better to be prepared? Like, how did I not see this coming? But then I'm like, wait, the question I asked, like, how could I have seen this coming? But it was such a defining moment for me because it made me realize, like, don't ever underestimate the power of just giving someone your undivided attention. And like, don't assume, don't assume anything about anybody's life. Um, and so I think in that moment, I felt, I felt like a failure in the sense that I hadn't anticipated where this conversation would go. But it was also that question in that moment that made me realize I wanted to ask people about their lives and I wanted to ask them about their lives in a space that was extremely controversial um, and like very black and white in the world's eyes, which was doping. Um, and so I would like, I still remember that failed interview um, as if it was yesterday and it's been over 10 years now. Uh, but I remember in the moment thinking like, I can't like, obviously I just broke this person and like, I can't ever do research. Like 
I'm not qualified for this. I clearly asked the wrong questions and just talking to my supervisor after and then being able to reflect on it and be like, wow, no, that was actually a, an example of like the power of, of just providing space to people and like thinking about it later. It was like, how often does someone ask you a question with absolutely no, uh, no plans other than to just sit and listen? Like how many t in our daily lives, how often do we just get a chance to just talk mm. candidly about something, especially something that like the world tells you don't talk about? Um, so now like that, that's probably the defining moment of my career. Um, but in that moment, it was like the biggest failure ever of like, how do you botch an interview about why did you get involved in sport? Yeah. I mean, like I'd say, I wouldn't even consider that, but for you to have that insight afterwards is amazing. Um, wow. You've blown my mind. Like, <laughs> and it's one of those things that you've just, you've just touched on, um, that we don't necessarily give time to talk and talk about these important issues. Like I didn't, you know, I'd known you on and off for, oh God, no. <laughs> a while. Yeah, a while. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know any of this. I just, from, from Tom's perspective, for the listeners out there, Tom's my husband who worked alongside you, is I just saw you as, which you still are, this incredible powerhouse who literally just, you know, for, I thought you'd picked a trajectory and, and that's what you, you chased. And I was just like, there's, there's nothing stopping her. You know, she's got this amazing job in America and your career path has been incredible. Um, and I did know that you were incredibly empathetic, but yeah, it's, it's been amazing. And thank you so much for sharing your story, um, with me today. Cause yeah, um, I'm for sure lots of people out there will be massively inspired. So where can, um, people find you? Great question. Um, so you can find me on Instagram, Kelsley777. I'm on Twitter, also Kelsley777. Um, and What's the 777? <laughs> that was my favorite number for a okay. while. <laughs> and that's like my childhood email address. <laughs> okay. um, so those are probably the two best ways. Or you can also email me at k.erickson at leadsbeckett.ac.uk. Um, but yeah, it, social media is probably the easiest way. I think one thing I want to add is, and to your point um, that you just said of like, I think people from the outside looking in often think of me as like, I just go after everything I want. And I think it's really important to, to be very honest that that is, that is not the reality. Like I, like I said at the beginning, I have just tried to be open to the opportunities that are available to me and not be afraid to say yes to them when, when they're made available. And two things here, one, I, the other, going back to the question of failure, when I was looking for a job, I, I knew I wanted to go back to the U S I no joke, probably applied to a hundred jobs and got zero interviews. And at the time, everyone around me, like in, in academia was like, Oh my gosh, like you're going to have a million job opportunities. Like everyone's going to want you. And I, was crying like every week, I, like every day, because here's all these people telling me how amazing I am and everything that I'm accomplishing and like how everyone's going to want me. And that was the opposite of what I was experiencing. Like no matter the job, whether I was applying for like, and I applied for anything, like anything and everything. And I got no interviews. Uh, and that lasted for probably six months. Like it wasn't a short period. It was a long time. And I just felt totally rejected and I'm pretty hopeless about like my opportunities. Um, but now like having the job and having stayed where I am now, like nobody sees that nobody, nobody saw that, that period of time. And so I think that's important to acknowledge, um, is that it hasn't been like that, that felt, I felt like a failure. Like here I am just getting, I just finished my PhD. Like I've gotten these recognitions and up to this point and I've, you know, published and my Viva went great and like, yeah, I'm crushing it. And yet I can't get a job anywhere. Um, so that's an important thing to be honest and transparent about. Um, and then the other thing is, is just, yeah, around my career trajectory, you know, one question I think that we get asked a lot is, or told a lot is like, you know, what's your, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? And I've never had one. Um, again, my, my guide is where can I have the most positive impact on the most people in the shortest amount of time? And that's my plan. And and I'm going to follow that and, and I'm going to answer that question honestly. And I'm going to make decisions based on that. Um, but then to the last point of kind of what you said around like looking like you're confident and like just go get her. I, I think the reason I'm so confident is because I'm totally comfortable being an absolute idiot. Like <laughs> yeah. I'm super comfortable with the fact that I 
fall over all the time or run into walls or say dumb stuff or trip or don't have the answers. Like I've become really comfortable with that. And there's so much freedom that comes with that. And so I think that like, especially as women, like there's the more you can just lean into like, this is who I am, take it or leave it. Like some people are going to like me. Some people aren't. And that's okay. Like, I don't need to be best friends with everyone, but like, I'm going to be who I am. And, and I'm just going to lean into that. Like that's where confidence grows is just being like comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and like being able to make fun of yourself. Like I make fun of myself all the time. Cause if I didn't like with the amount of dumb stuff I do on a daily basis, like I would never leave the house. And, and think, that's I important. Think, I think everyone needs to go and follow Kelsey on Instagram <laughs> because you will realize, and I know a lot of these stories, you will realize just exactly, <laughs> I want to say car crash, but like yeah. we, we, we have discussed stuff like, like you said, I fell off a treadmill. I did. That is a story. But you seem to have these like situations where I'm like, how does she get herself? It's just like when you went trekking that time and you got lost and they had to send that search parties and yeah and I in our I, backyard yeah and I, yeah it's like <laughs> it's a place you knew and I think this this is so good because social media um and to a certain extent things like podcasts everyone sees the good side and yeah behind that is to lean into you know who you truly are and you do that so well um and I hope that you do that in your job too. I hope that. <laughs> yeah. And it helps. Like, that's the thing is like, especially as women, like we want to have everything all put together. And I'm like, that's just not true. Like, yeah. and so like, I'm so thankful to have the opportunity to talk with you on this podcast because I, I think it's important for me as well to just be honest and transparent about my flaws and like my challenges and even OCD. Like I don't really talk openly about that. And it's only become more like I've been inspired by hearing other people and hearing athletes talk candidly about like things that they've dealt with. And so I think I have an obligation and an opportunity, um, to be honest about that with other people and just be like, Hey, this is something I deal with. Like, this is something that has been a big part of my life, but it's, it's not, it's not just been a bad thing. Like it's not been a negative. Obviously I I would prefer not to have it, but it's made me who I am today. And so it's important that I share that piece of my story. And same with like, like I've looked at my Instagram recently and was like, man, I don't think I've ever posted a single like attractive picture of me. Like it's <laughs> me always <too. laughs> me being an idiot and making fun of myself. But like, that's important too, because yeah. you, you can be both things. Like I can be a professional and also fall down the stairs the minute I walk out of a lecture, <laughs> like those can coexist and it's okay. And actually it makes life more entertaining. And so I think that the more uh, as women, the more that we can just like be okay with that and be real, like. I can't emphasize enough how freeing that is. Like if I need to go cry, which I have, Mm -hmm. like one of my colleagues, uh, I did a, I did a presentation a while back and a a man in the audience asked this great question of like, as a male, how can I, how can I help support the women in my organization and empower them? And I was like, uh, in hindsight, like maybe should have thought about my answer more, but, um, what I, I think essentially what I said to him is like, don't overthink it. And I, I was like, just last week, like, I had a really bad day. I like was holding it together, refused to cry in front of the person that I was going to cry in front of and like went downstairs. And one of my male colleagues has a uh, van, like one, you know, like a sprinter van. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I need your keys. And he's like, what, why you have your own keys? And I was like, I need your keys. And you know, he's like, why? I'm like, I need your keys. And so he gives me his keys and I just go out to the sprinter van and sit in the back and start crying because I just wanted to get out of the building. I didn't want anyone to be able to see me. Um, and then he, you know, he comes a little bit later and like opens the door and is like, oh gosh, like, do you need anything? And I'm like, no, I just need your van to cry. And I'm like, that's all I needed from him. Like, that's what I need. That's how I needed to be empowered. Yeah. That was exactly what I needed. Mm -hmm. That's it. And so, you know, like, and, and and then another person like followed it up and was like, "I, I thank you so much for like admitting that you cried. And I'm like, admitting that I cried, like, how is that a, like, that should not be profound, but I'm like, dude, sometimes you just need to cry and then like move on. Yeah. And sometimes you're lucky enough to have a male colleague that owns a sprinter van that you can cry. Yeah. Like, that's fine. So I think the more that we can just be honest about that and not like, yeah, I'm a pretty strong, confident woman, but I cry and I get sad and all of those things make me better at my job Yeah, because I actually feel and I have emotions. And then when things happen and other people are hurting and need somebody to come alongside them or need somebody to to be empathetic or to make tough decisions or to stand up for them. Like I can do that because I have emotions and I can feel. Um, and so I think as women, especially women in male dominated environments, like instead of like 
closing off more, open up more. Yeah. Cause you have no idea like what the power that that can have for the people around you. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And, um, wow. You know, the people on the US cycling team are extremely lucky <laughs> to have you. Um, I don't know if they always feel that way, but. <laughs> well, send them over. They're I'll be, entertained. I'll, I'll beat them up. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. If it's that, but, um, you are doing incredible things and you are really showing the next generation um, of girls um, what can be done and what can be achieved. And honestly as well, and not being afraid to be themselves. So I can only give you thanks for that. And also, before we finish, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. wow! So, yes, as a perfect guest, um, <laughs> is your very own She Who Dares Wins hoodie. I'm so <laughs> honored. I will wear it with such pride. You're welcome. Oh, um, I love it. And it's because you embody everything about the brand, the tribe, the community. Um, and so I wanted you to have a little piece to take back to the US. And it's my way of saying thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. It was an honor. Thank you for what you're doing and you're for welcome. providing a platform for those of us that are living life to be able to just speak and learn from one another and connect with one another and know that we're not alone. I think like we could never under we can never underestimate how significant that is. Just to know that there's other people out there that are human and are doing the best that they can any given day. And as women especially, we need that. Amazing. Thank you, Kelsey. Appreciate Thank it. you.